For the implementation of nature-based solutions, its main elements, service design, spatial design and the business model need to come together and become operational in time. So let's do a quick recap. Service design focuses on the private and public organization, facilitation and initiation of nature-based solutions and the planning of maintenance of the nature-based solutions after its placement. Spatial design looks into site specificity and the suitability of a space to place a certain type of nature-based design solutions. And at last, the business model does the leverage by assessing and proving the value of the ecosystem services delivered by nature to be operationalized. But for the nature-based solution, this is not where it ends. Actually, it's just a start. In this video, we will discuss implementation as a way of designing synthesis how things come together. The implementation of nature-based uh, nature solution differs from the implementation of grey infrastructures. Nature-based solutions are about placemaking, implemented in both the public and private sphere by using natural principles, so it results in an adaptive design which is often in a way open-ended. The location of a nature-based solution is fixed in space, but it has a dynamic content with a major aspect of uncertainty depending on the one hand on the natural element and on the other hand on society. Almost all natural principles deployed in nature-based solutions depend on evolution and growth and have a very important temporal dimension. The fundamental difference between working with nature or a hard piece of infrastructure is that nature changes over time. Nature is constantly growing and is therefore in need of constant maintenance. This also means that nature-based design solutions will not have the same performance right after its placements than when we are, let's say, uh, 20 years further. These dynamics ask for the pairing of programs, as the performance uh, of the space will change and the different types of uses unlock as the landscape grows. The pairing of programs and the synchronization of different uses can be seen in various timescales. Think about how the usage and performance of a space can change with the seasons, or how it can vary on weekdays and in weekends. Even within a day we can make use of the multifunctionality of nature-based solutions to pair programs. City parks, for instance, are busiest on weekends in summer. They can be used for sport lessons before working hours in the morning, and primary schools can take the kids there during the day. At the same time, the success of nature-based solutions depends on the societal involvement and the appropriation and public-private partnership. This means that within communities, awareness has to be created and the learning process is a part of the societal change. In order to stimulate the community, we can make use of incentives. Incentives are forms of reward to encourage people to use or take care of a space. This can either be a subsidy, the funding for an event, lower taxes or just a voucher. These stimuli also change with the naturally changing landscape. For the implementation to be successful, it is important to state the objective of where you want to arrive so that the synthesis of institutional, spatial and economic design can come towards this final goal. Subsequently, we have to backcast to set out the different stages to reach that goal and see where we are dependent of natural growth and how society can be involved and what incentives can be used. In this way, you basically design the transformation. An easy way to communicate the transition, the pairing of programs, the incentives and the succession as nature grows, is with a timeline. To introduce you to the power of the timeline, we will discuss an iconic project calls, called Fresh Kills in New York City. In 1947, a temporary location was found for New York City's waste storage along the western coast, uh, coast of Staten Island. But, as rates of consumption were rising exponentially in the years after the Second World War, the site soon became the principal landfill for New York City. Consumption rates obviously kept on growing ever since, but as you all know, the city's population also grew. Fifty years later, what was left of the 90, uh, 9 square kilometer uh, wetlands was 9 square kilometers of hilly landscape. However, these hills, all with a height of about 60 meters, they were all filled with trash, making it the biggest landfill in the world. In answer to the negative impact on nearby communities, the landfill was closed and the Department of City Planning, along with the Department of State's Division uh, of Coastal Resources, initiated the plan to regenerate the decommissioned landfill into a park. 
facilitating natural habitats for wildlife, recreation, scenic looks, sports and nature education. As you might have understood by now, these goals will not be accomplished right after the start of the regeneration. We translated the 30-year master plan uh, to a timeline to guide you through the evolution of the wasteland towards a park. Initially, the uh, existing site is a landfill without public access or amenity. But a few years after closure of the landfill and stopping the dumping of waste, the first part of the site can be reclaimed as public landscapes. As the negative image and conditions of the landfill decrease, the landscape diversity, but also visitors, increase. To boost the transformation and the use uh, of the growing public space, events like a festival, market or sport event can be organized as an incentive. In the case of a large-scale park like Fresh Kills, the implementation of park roads increased the connectivity for users of the park, but also accelerated uh, the reclamation of the site as a public parkland. In this way, the transformation is facilitated and the exposure is stimulated. At a certain point, recreational uses like restaurants, cultural facilities and sport amenities can activate the site on a larger scale and the uptake of the park reaches new heights. The same counts for the performance. The decomposing waste in the soil allows for the collection of natural gas capable of heating approximately 20,000 homes. And after the devastations of Hurricane Sandy in 2012, Fresh Kills has proven itself by absorbing much of the storm surge and redistributing the accumulating water, buffering the impact on neighboring residential areas. Around this moment, the construction costs start to decrease and evolve into the effort of collective maintenance, which outweighs the valuation and natural functioning of the park, which are in full bloom. <laughs> 